A round of applause to Hulk Canagata and New York team for making this happen. Thank you so much to everyone up here. You've probably seen them. If you haven't met them, you should. And that's Lisa. That's Lisa. Host committee. So uh, thank you to our sponsors. You'll hear from them in a second. Uh, if you're interested in becoming one, email me. Uh, we'd love to take your money, depending on your interest level and what you do. Um, but probably yes. Um, quick shout out to, to Wayne. Uh, Wayne introduced us to, uh, to MGO. So we always appreciate uh, all those introductions from folks in the community to help power what we do. So thank you to Wayne Kaufman. and. Uh, Send some, send some leads our way, and uh, you scratch our back, and we'll hug you. So, Cole Shots, who is speaking from Cole Shots? We got someone from Cole Shots. Hi, Cole Shots. I, I thought you were Rob for a second, but then I realized you weren't wearing glasses, and so. That's right, someone, somebody new for a change. Uh, my name is Julius Malov, I'm from Cole Shots. We're uh, a law firm. I do tax trusts and estates. Uh, but we're basically a full uh, service group for the cannabis industry. Uh, and it's, it's great to be at this event. It's my first can of gather actually myself, but I've heard a lot about it from Rob and Mark and the rest of our group. It's great to see so many women in the room. We <laughs> so, you know, what a great way for our generation to, to do something very new and exciting and to invest and, and make things happen. So. You know, let's keep it going and, and uh, you know, have, make the rest of these events a success in March 19th and the 6th before that. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. You know, Mr. Brian Wagner, you want to come on up? Hi, uh, I'm Brian from Capolino and Company. We are uh, the leading government relations and strategic consultancy in New York. Uh, we work at the intersection of government, business, and the community, helping clients to uh, unlock opportunities, navigate challenges, and mitigate risks in what is arguably one of the more challenging and uniquely hassly uh, business environments in the country, which is New York. So uh, we're divided uh, structurally into a number of practice groups. We do a lot of real estate work, environmental work, um, permitting and licensing work, legislative work, minority and women-owned business work. Uh, I'm forgetting a few things here and there, but essentially, if you're a business operating in New York, you're going to come up against issues in the community, the government, private sector stuff. We're helping our clients to navigate those challenges uh, so they can build a sustainable uh, business and plan for the future. And, uh, and hopefully grow uh, beyond uh, their hopes and dreams. So if you're interested uh, in hearing more about how we can help your cannabis business, whether you are a, an ancillary business, um, uh, you're going to have a physical space, you have some legislative concerns, licensing questions, um, you can uh, come find me or ask Josh for my contact information. You can check us out at www.capolino.com. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, sir. Small, small addendum, uh, in addition to helping uh, you know, grow beyond your hopes and dreams, if you want to grow your hopes and dreams, see what I did there? Talk to Brian, literally. Literally, yes, exactly. So now the moment you've probably been waiting for the entire time I've been talking. Not me talking. Well, well, well. You know, it was a really interesting evening for me. I um, wasn't feeling that good today. And so I kind of stayed home and laid on my bathroom floor with my cat. And I was like, okay, I can make it to Canagather. Why? I wasn't feeling good. I should have stayed home. Josh would have understood. You all would have understood if I was feeling under the weather. But the thing is, is I made time for Canagather because it's important to me. It's very important to me to show up for my community. That's why I'm the vice president of community for Canagather. Growing your relationships is super important. Being part of the industry is the relationships that you have and the resources that you have access to. And I find that I make time for the things that are important 
to me. So if being part of the cannabis industry is extremely important to you, then you got to fucking show up. And how do you do that? By coming to events like this. You know, I met Josh at an NCIA event two years ago. Ronnie and Josh took me under their wing and said, okay, Kimby, we're going to make you a star. I'm just kidding. I met at Women Grow, my business partner, Dej, and, you know, we have a successful company now. And it's these events that not only build the relationships, but fortify them. So, yeah, it's dope to keep your network popping and, and meet as many people as possible. But what about growing those relationships, fortifying those relationships? And I recommend that you check out our monthly membership, not because I get paid to talk about it, because I don't, um, but that locks you in to show up. If you want to be part of the cannabis industry and successful, you have to show up. And that's basically the whole thing right there. And tonight, Jean said to me, you have to meet my friend. This is Kim B. She's a celebrity. And I was like, my jaw. When Jean calls you a celebrity, I'm like, oh my God, I'm a celebrity. I have to call my sister. Like, it's the first thing I wanted to do because I show up to the events. Anyway, I have a 30 second update from my friend, Doug Green, because he knows the good shit of the bill that we are all talking about. So 30 seconds on the mic. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> Really quick, um, Ben and Nancy, please stand up wherever you are. Ben and, ben and Nancy. Ben and Nancy, they're my teammates with Empire State Normal, fellow board members. So 30 seconds. Um, we are part, we are a pillar group of the Start Smart New York Coalition. Uh, it's a broad campaign coalition for um, cannabis justice in New York. We did a lobby day last week on the 12th. The next major lobby day is going to be on March 27th. There are going to be smaller lobby days every Tuesday through April 1st when the budget is due. Um, the governor came out with his 30-day amendments last week, mostly technical changes. There's still a lot of work to do. We are weak with women. We're evenly split among women, and we are getting crushed in the suburbs. So we need a lot of help with that. We are trying to do this as part of the budget. If this is not done as part of the budget, there's a good chance it's going to get picked apart. Um, please look us up on what social is, media. And yes, yeah, Kim? Social media? Um, Empire State Normal. We're EmpireStateNormal.com, Instagram, and, yes. and uh, Smart-NY.com. Start Smart in New York. That's the Broad Campaign Coalition. And what is the next rally, the big rally date? March. And that's in Albany? Correct. And there's free buses and things, right? Yes, there will be buses from Union Square. All right, guys. So you heard it here. That's important. If we don't show up for our community, what kind of community we are we? No. And you heard it there because that's someone who went there. So anyway, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Good evening, everyone. Gather around. Welcome to the wild world of weed. I'm your plug for news and events. This is Cannabis with Kim B. Starting off with some news out of New York. Last month, Governor Cuomo laid out his adult use cannabis plan. The deal includes three taxes and says that the sales could begin as early as April 1st, 2020. Or April 1st, 3131. If you consider how long it actually takes to start something in this state, hashtag making progress. Now let's talk cannabis banking. That's moolah, baby. Historic steps were taken this month when the House Financial Service Committee heard testimony on industry woes. The bill had uncertain future, but does have the support of many lawmakers because Lord knows the largest industry in the country operating without a bank is a swell idea. Hashtag we'll go crypto if they say no. Now the latest about hemp. Senators Wyden and McConnell recently pushed for hemp's legalization to occur expeditiously. It's amazing how cannabis gets us all working together. Wouldn't it be nice if we could get some THC in the mix and see if we can start coming together as a country? Hashtag doubt it. Next, we head to New Mexico. State legislators are calling for the legalization of cannabis, but a few senators want to ha the state to handle the sales. The bill was introduced by Republican Senator Mark Morris, who said, we should do it in a smart way. Well, Senator Morris, that ain't the way. Hashtag for the people by the people. And lastly, in teen 
hot youth news. A recent Boston College study found that the legal medical cannabis states had a lower teen use. This just proves the war on drugs. Would it worked if instead of arresting people of color, we told kids pot was medicine that their parents thought was cool. Hashtag, oh my God, my parents are the worst. And that is it for this evening, guys. Thank you so much. Make sure you follow me on Instagram. If you are not, that's Cannabis with Kim B. And shout out to my writer, Andrew. Where are you, Andrew? Andrew writes all my hilarious shit for me. So thank you so much. Have a great night, guys. Cool. Thank you, Kim. Um, so yeah, uh, just to take a step back, um, as most of you know, there was a bill that the governor introduced uh, for legalization, which is very exciting. Um, there's a difference of opinion in terms of certain parts of uh, the bill um, that, as Doug was sort of alluding to, uh, we would love for the folks involved in the bill to come to the event and share their views. Um, hopefully that will happen. Um, in the meantime, uh, if you're interested in learning more, uh, definitely speak with, with Brian from Capolino. Speak with Doug, uh, one of the, the most uh, well-educated people uh, about uh, legalization and, and legislation in New York State um, that I've, I know and have known for, for multiple years. So uh, I have my own views, but Doug is smarter. So talk to him uh, and Brian. So what was that? Uh, I did go to Princeton, but um, that doesn't matter. I, I, I mean, he, he turned out okay. Me, I, I don't know. Um, uh, Ethan, well, he, long, long conversation. So um, New York State legalization, obviously very important. Uh, the timetable for that is around April, uh, the beginning of April, um, for when we'll see what's going to happen there. Um, more exciting uh, than uh, Amazon news, that's for certain. Um, so get excited if you're not aware and up to speed on what's going on with New York State legalization, let's talk about it. Uh, and then also banking. Um, sort of rumor, I'm not candidly super plugged in, but rumor uh, is they're hoping for something Q2, Q3. Um, again, that's all just total hearsay, but that we're actually having some progress in terms of hearings uh, at a congressional level is very promising. Um, so those are some of the two pieces of news from, from Kim that we're very excited about. Uh, if you are interested in, in federal um, legalization and, and lobbying, uh, NCIA will be doing lobbying days uh, in uh, April, late April. Um, so chat with me about that. So let's uh, introduce some of our other sponsors, uh, ABS. Great. Thanks, Josh. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Brian Barkovitz, and I, I am a partner at ABS Engineering. We are a boutique HVAC, electrical, plumbing, fire sprinkler, fire alarm design firm. So we will design your facility. So if you have a cannabis business that whether you grow it, you process it, or you want to sell it, we can help you with your permits. We can design all the building systems that will, you know, make it work. Um, anyways, I just want to say thanks to Josh for having us. So we've been coming for a couple months. It's nice to see some familiar faces. We were up in uh, Boston for Seed to Sale last week. That was really great. Um, I'd, I'd say the coolest thing about this is the sense of community. Uh, you know, we're kind of coming from a pretty savage New York City construction background. And uh, it's kind of cool to come here and like have a real uh, free exchange of knowledge and uh, people you know, just fighting for the greater cause. So that's what we're about. Um, check us out. Those, that's our website and our Instagram. And I uh, hope to hear from you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, man. Thank you, Brian. Lewis Chester Associates. Oh, oh thank you. This thing on here. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron. I'm from Lewis Chester Associates Insurance. Uh, we're located in Summit, New Jersey. Uh, this is the first can of gather out here in New York that I came to, and it's really nice to see the numbers here. It's really wonderful. Um, I've been doing a bunch over in, in New Jersey, um, the, and um, it's really, really nice to see the community come together. A lot of excitement in this area. Um, obviously, New Jersey is really close. New York won't be very far behind. Um, we offer insurance um, that's cannabis specific, okay? Uh, if anybody has been out there putting their plans together and have looked into insurance, they can know it's, it's pretty much of a jungle right now. Um, it's not clear. Um, you know, there are 
some um, you know companies that you know are jumping into the insurance field right now. Um, but you know, right now we have focused in on three you know specific carriers that we're using. Um, it's very important that you know when you're putting your plans together not to wait to get an insurance quote till the very end. Okay, uh, the premiums right now you know might be surprising to some people, so you really need to be prepared for that. All right, so please talk to somebody. I don't want to sugarcoat it to say that everything's going to be inexpensive like your house insurance. It's not going to be, okay? Um, and it's not going to be that way probably for a couple of years until they change something at the federal level and that the bigger carriers can come in. But right now, we do have spaces for you. We do have markets for you, okay? Um, the biggest thing I can tell you right now is that I see a lot of people, I've been doing a lot of research online, um, if you are marketing your business, if you're branding your business right now, if you have a website, social media, if you have business cards, okay, and you're attending events and you're talking to investors about your upcoming, uh, you know, venture project, you are already opening yourself up to perils and risks, okay? You may not even know it, you know, we're not even doing anything yet, but, you know, you are, all right? If you, someone thinks that you've taken their intellectual property, you might get a letter in the mail. So the best advice I can give you if you are, seriously putting together a plan is to get to an uh, insurance agent, talk to them about a business operations policy that you can start right away. They're very inexpensive and you know, you don't want to sabotage your dream before you even get started. Okay, that's the best advice I can give you. So uh, follow me on Facebook at Insure Cannabis and Instagram on Insure Cannabis. Uh, I keep on trying to put as much information upstairs about the business side of the cannabis business. So just, you know, take a look. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, if you're if you're uh, thinking about entrepreneurship or if you're getting started as an entrepreneur, um, definitely speak to uh, qualified service providers. Um, you definitely don't want your entire company being stolen for any reason, and you want to protect yourself uh, from that. So, um, so THC regs, THC regs, come on up. Hi, uh, my name is Susan. And uh, we uh, help uh, organizations who are actually joining the cannabis industry. We can help you identify where you can find a cannabis license. We can help you develop a compliance program and help you maintain a compliance program. And getting a cannabis license is like getting an apartment in New York. So you have to know when the open houses are and you have to show up with your application because they go very quickly. Um, and I think businesses on the West Coast have really um, perfected the art of finding the licenses. So on the East Coast, we have to act, qu act quickly and we have to find out where they are. Um, and from a compliance perspective, uh, we have really great technology. Compliance is important because it not only allows you to keep your license, it also allows you to attract capital. Uh, so uh, compliance programs and, and maintaining it and making sure that you're doing everything that you should is a very important component of the cannabis industry. Well said. Thank you, Susan. Palermo's Pay Junction, I believe the last person that we have coming up. Uh, I think he's running right now. There he is. I saw someone running down the hall. Uh, we have some, some uh, standing room over there if you guys want to migrate. How you all doing? I'm glad to see everybody out here. We're here to support as well. Um, my name is Michael and my wife Christina is there as well. Um, we're here at Player Most Paid Unction. We do uh, merchant processing, uh, the credit card industry. We help all your businesses get your money. <laughs> so we're able to um, board the clients that are doing the cannabis industry and uh, we're one of the few in the nation at this time. Uh, so we do next day funding, our rates are competitive, we treat you just like any other business, a deli or whatever, so just because you're in the cannabis industry doesn't mean you have to pay six, seven percent. And I believe that firmly, so I'm proud to be able to say I can do that. We do free equipment, we have POSs, so we really talk to you folks, find out what you want for your business and come in and give it what you're looking for or get as close as I can. That's it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. As I said, I, I don't know how you do what you do, but I'm going to send you an email and we will talk about stuff tomorrow. Um, uh, Craig from uh, your CBD oils, longtime partner. You've, you saw him. Uh, he's right there. That's Craig. Um, you saw him. Uh, 
longtime partner. Uh, you saw him at his table. If you're interested in CBD oils or anything CBD or any education CBD related, he's the guy to talk to. And speaking of CBD, uh, Kim is a very successful company, as she was speaking about with Deja somewhere. Uh, but they have a table. Um, they're awesome. Um, Greg's awesome too, sort of transitive property of associate, or associated property, I should say. Um, Ello, uh, so MGO and Ello. Um, one, uh, one of our board members is actually part of Ello, Evan Eneman. Uh, MGO is a full service accounting firm. They're hiring very a uh, actively. Uh, so if you're looking uh, to break into the industry uh, uh, from a full time employment standpoint, then definitely speak with them. Uh, Cat is here. Uh, Cat Air, actually. Um, so if you're looking to learn more about MGO uh, or Ello, which is more on the strategy side, if I'm saying that properly, um, then speak to Kat. Marino PR, um, we got Jordan uh, in the house, I think. Uh, Marino PR, yeah, round of applause, why not? Um, uh, full service PR firm, so anything PR related, uh, you probably were speaking with him uh, out there. Uh, definitely get in touch. And, and last but not least, we have um, three of our last sponsors, BDS Analytics. Um, BDS is uh, one of the leading data providers in this space. Uh, Roy Bingham spoke in December of 2017 at Canagather. His talk was incredibly informative. It was a 70 uh, slide uh, presentation. So if you're interested in checking that out, uh, that's on our website. He's hiring for a regional sales manager. Um, so email me if you're interested in speaking with him or just go on their website, Tress Capital, leading provider of uh, venture capital here in New York and around the country for cannabis related businesses. Splash is our event software. And that's all of our sponsors. So, um, if you're like, hey, what's the next can of gather? Well, yes, as mentioned, 319, we'll talk about that. But in New Jersey, uh, across, the, across the river, we got, we're going back to Trenton. Um, on 226, we got Leo and Ronnie sitting right there. If you have any questions about, <laughs> about New Jersey, um, as you probably know, if you are in Jersey, they are the guys to talk to about all things New Jersey. I think that was a, an echo of uh, appreciation and an amen. Um, so uh, yeah, we got uh, two great speakers. So be sure to check that out on the 26th in Trenton. Um, and then some of our other events coming up, if you go to nextevent.canagather.com, uh, we'll be in DC on Thursday. Uh, we'll be in LA again. So we had uh, 171 people um, in LA uh, on the 5th. We had Nick, the CEO of Kush, which is a half billion dollar uh, publicly traded uh, ancillary company. Um, we uh, have another comparably sized company, uh, CEO speaking. We just I just found this out a couple hours ago. So if you're going to be in LA, uh, I think I'll probably go back out for it. It should be good. And then uh, we have Kevin Hart um, speaking from Green Check Verified, uh, who's here, who's right there. Um, he's going to be our speaker in uh, Connecticut. And then what's going to happen on 519? We got Paul Chu. Uh, Paul Chu's from Weekend Unlimited. We got some guys. I think Carl. Uh, from, from We Get Unlimited in the house. Uh, we also have the CEO of the Canadian Securities Exchange. Uh, and if you're in the investment world, uh, we have probably the leader uh, in investment analysis, uh, Alan Brockstein from 420 Investor and New Cannabis Ventures. So um, I was basically like, how do we follow up um, this guy? So I had to get like three leading guys or girls, either just gender neutral guys. Uh, we would love more women. We had two women speakers last month. If you have suggestions for female speakers, definitely send them our way. Um, I was like, you know, I needed to get a really good, good crew up because we had such an amazing speaker coming up. Uh, and I'll introduce them in a second, but a couple notes. Remember after party across the street, we got some free pizzas and I love free stuff. Um, so I will be there both because the pizza is good and because it's free. The name tags. The bane of my existence. We did not have him this time. We had him last time. But we'll have him next time. Gene, Gene's going to help. Gene's going to help. Um, and you don't need to print your tickets. You can just say your name at the door. Um, and make sure to get your New Jersey and New York tickets at this website or this website. And without further ado, round of applause for the one and only John Stossel. So John Stossel is basically super famous, and so the question is, what's he doing at Canagather? So should we should we start the video? You guys here? No. Disaster you predicted hasn't happened. I think it has happened. Paul Chabot was a drug warrior who 
served in both the Clinton and Bush administrations. Before legalization, he told me, changing the law would lead to disaster. We know statistically the drug usage numbers are going to skyrocket. He hasn't changed. I don't think I did anything. The numbers are clear. Colorado youth is going to be 5% higher than marijuana use Surveys we found show teen use did not increase. Get this from some prosecutor who wants to lock people off. But the New England Journal of Medicine says the proportion of high school and middle school students who reported using marijuana dropped. Yeah, these studies have some major issues with them. They're not looking at Denver or El Paso County. They, they look at the overall population. I just sure don't trust the New England Journal more than some DA we found. Well, it's not the issue. It's actually <laughs> So, uh, to all the uh, all the non-patriots, I won't say the T word, but all the non-patriots in this room who are pro cannabis, I guess, could you share? You know, what brings you? I guess, do you want to give a little bit of background about who you are and what brings you to the the world of cannabis? And in addition to that, this good-looking man that we have up here. Uh, I've been a TV reporter for about a hundred years. I, I'm a stutterer, so I didn't want to be on the beat competing to cover politics. So I said, I'll be a consumer reporter. Nobody was doing it. And I won 19 Emmy Awards calling for more government regulation. <laughs> Don't applaud that. Emmy Awards are bullshit. This is what the, the shallow media reward themselves to people who call for more government intervention in your life. And after winning the awards and doing the scare stories and calling for the new rules and often getting them, they'd pass rules, I finally saw that the rules were causing more problems than the problem they were supposed to prevent. I read a little more, I became a libertarian, and I've been a libertarian zealot ever since. <laughs> Uh, ABC, I was host of 2020 at the time, they got a little sick of my libertarian stories. Strangely, Fox was more receptive. They gave me a show for seven years where I would fight with Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly about weed. But they're such good guys, why would you fight with them? <laughs> Trump says all great things about them. He does, yeah. And what I found surprising is that Fox never censored me doing stuff on gay marriage or having smaller military, all the normal right-wing hot-button items. But the hosts, after one argument, wouldn't want to have another. That everybody wants to talk to people who agree with them, and that's kind of sad. Anyway, eventually, the guy you know, my son, who followed you in school, uh, some of you know Max Stossel, uh, said, Dad, you, nobody's going to believe what you say about free markets when you're on Fox because they don't trust Fox. And I think that's true in New York, probably not true in Texas. <laughs> but you don't need a network anymore because you've got a million Twitter followers and you can get these messages out on social media. So I started doing that two years ago. I raised funds. And I just lost a big donation today, so I'm going to go out of business in a year unless some of you can help me. If you can, please let me know. Um, but I started making these five-minute videos, and that was th what you watched was a piece of one. Uh, we did, well, I'll let you lead this interview. I won't rant so long. I think you, you have a lot more experience doing the whole interview thing than I do. So. I <laughs> I do defer to you. Um, but yeah, so uh, I went to uh, middle school uh, with uh, John's son, um, where Mary Mello taught, um, and, uh, and apparently was Max's teacher, which is a crazy small world. Um, and uh, I saw one of John's videos, one of his viral videos. Um, he's done a couple about cannabis. And I was like, bro, you got to hook it up. <laughs> and uh, he was like, I don't know, maybe. Um, so. Thank you, Max, um, for, for introducing us. Um, so you did go to Princeton. Uh, I went to Princeton. We were in the same eating club. 
So eating club, for many of you, is a douchey way of saying, it's sort of a combination of a fraternity and a sorority, then mixed with a dining hall. So technically we're brothers, yeah. or sisters, or both. So um, very, very cool, small world. Um, and very excited to see, I think, you know, we probably have some differences of, of opinion given, um, you know, the, the quote unquote Fox thing, but in terms of cannabis, we're completely aligned, I think. So I guess what to you is, is sort of the driving force behind your view that cannabis should be legal? All right, I'm gonna give you another long-winded answer. So Good. I was covering scares, and we don't realize how many of them there are and how irresponsible the media is in hyping them. But I just looked at the list of scares I covered over my career. This is not the whole list. Coffee, plastic bottles, electric power lines, they were causing cancer, supposedly. Saccharin, aspartame, cyclamate, same, cancer. Asbestos in hair dryers, West Nile virus, Y2K. Remember that? The planes were all going to crash. <laughs> Shark attacks, that's good TV. Sharknado so is a great that. movie. Killer bees, mad cow disease, SARS, Bic lighters are spontaneously exploding in people's pockets, setting them on fire. Flesh-eating bacteria, overpopulation, now climate change, they kept coming and we in the media made more money the more we hyped them. And we are totally venal. What happens is you talk to the people who are alarmed, and there's always some scientist, and he gets you worked up. We, all the planes are gonna crash. Uh, global warming is going to kill us all. Probably will. What we for <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the areas where we disagree. I think that's pretty much the only one. Even if it is, there's nothing we can do about it now, but that's another story. <laughs> what we forget is that the scientist who says, you know, I really looked at the brain tumors from cell phones and I can't really prove that it causes brain tumors. He gets no publicity. He doesn't get invited on 2020. He doesn't get a big grant from the government. But the guy who says, yes, this will kill you, he gets the grant. And in the media, if I say, tonight on 2020, this will kill you, you'll watch. If I say, life's pretty good. We're living longer, <laughs> you won't. <laughs> so the media is, is our enemy in many of these areas. So then I, we look at safety issues and I was smoking weed. I saw that it wasn't the danger some people thought it was. But then I thought, what, so what about meth and crack? And there were totally irresponsible stories about crack uh, based on one study of 17 kids, crack babies that were children like no other. It was bullshit. It just smeared these kids for life. Um, but clearly, some of these other drugs are scarier. But as a libertarian, I have come to think that once you're an adult, I mean, what is freedom if you don't own your own body? That just should be part of life. If you want to take crack, you should be allowed. And the laws against these things, in every case, do more harm than the drugs. So that's what I want. Raise your hand if you think that uh, you agree with that and think cannabis should be legal. Cannabis. Okay, so Come on, how about crack and meth and cocaine? <laughs> I begin. I think, I think we're about 65% based on my, my hand raising math. Um, I would have expected higher, but you know, we have diverse views here. Um, so it, it sounds like you started as a consumer, which is awesome, um, that you were initially a consumer and had, like, hey, you know, why is there all this fear mongering? Um, and it sounds like you have additional views that have evolved in terms of some of the benefits that we'll, we could reap from legalization and, and feel free to cut, tell me to cut to some of the slides um, if those would be all right, well, Clearly, I support legalization and uh, government gets in the way of so many good things. but. That said, going reporting in some of these videos in California and Colorado and Washington, we need to be realistic about the downside when we argue about this. So I fought with the drug warrior over use. And it's, you know, I cherry picked in this case. I put the slide up about kids. Fewer kids in Colorado are smoking weed. You want these, any of these? All right, things? so let's 
you know, there was going to be terrible crime if you legalize it. And I assumed there would be much less crime because people wouldn't have to rob. Uh, you put this one up, this is property crime in Colorado. So the data isn't so great for our side. It's not terrible and the jury is still out. But you look at property crime, it, it, crime went up recently and went up a little more in Colorado. Go to yeah, this the is Washington. Colorado, this is Washington, yeah. And in likewise in Washington as well. And the, the more important one is the next slide. Colorado or the driving deaths? Driving deaths. Mm. And look, how many of you have driven stone? Come on. It, you really think you're just as good, but you're not. And <laughs> what they're finding in these early tests is they're, they're testing people and they're finding cannabis. But of course, it stays in your system for so long that it's hard to know what that means. But now they have this other test where they can detect higher amounts. So you probably were high at the time. And that's what these are showing. Um, well, it's not, this isn't a test, but deaths are up a little in states where they legalized. So we need to be responsible and acknowledge that and encourage people not to drive high. I guess the, um, I guess one thing to note, going back to, you know, uh, Mikosh days was, uh, you know, it's probably a small sample size. Like, uh, are there a lot of deaths? Um, I mean, per 100,000 miles is maybe it's a, you know, one additional, I mean, not to trivialize death, like, by any means. Uh, that, that, I mean, it's, I guess it's funny, but it's not a joke. Um, it's like, not trivializing death is like, I, I, there's definite impairment from cannabis consumption, at least according to one doctor that I've consulted with. Um, but I wonder if that's like big jump might actually not be that big. No. So a compliment and a criticism. Nobody knows what Makash is here. You yeah. know? Jesus. Yeah. We went to Princeton with the inside yeah. joke. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was trying to not be douchey, but I became douchier. But, but you really it. make a good point. These Sorry. numbers that showed more traffic deaths, they're like, I accidentally erased, <laughs> erased it on my phone because I'm old and don't do this well. But it was something like 19 deaths four years ago and 35 deaths last year. So 35 deaths is nasty, but the numbers are small. Still sad, but um, yeah. Well, I'm from New York, so I don't drive. So um, hopefully it won't be part of those fatalities, that's for sure. So yeah, I mean, I think that there's definite sort of pros and cons, but I think that it's, it's clear beyond um, you know, the, the driving deaths that there's more uh, good that we'll see from legalization than, than harm, or am I misinterpreting what you're... No, I think so. And don't forget what you're up against. Fear drives so much. Uh, the excessive laws that came after September 11th, uh, the scares I covered. Let's just do one thought experiment here, if you'll indulge me. I, I, even you, you know, you... Once they legalize this, you're going to rush in and make your investments. I caution you, don't assume government will do what it says it will at the time it says it will. It will be longer. They will put up stupid obstacles. Um, everything will take longer because they're scared. If something bad happens, they would be blamed. It's easier to say no. And even you would say no. So let's, let's go back to your global warming subject. Let's talk about fuel. Uh, I'm a greedy businessman, you're the regulators, I have a new fuel I want approved, so should you approve it? Uh, it's no cheaper than oil, but it'll reduce America's dependence on OPEC, so that's good, but the same price. Trouble is, my fuel, unlike oil, which is flammable, let's say my fuel is highly explosive, it's so flammable, and invisible and odorless and deadly poisonous, and I want to pump it into your house. Should this be approved? Let's do a, the, who wants this, who says this should be approved? All right, who, who's a normal person and says it should not be approved? Somebody here in front, good. Or why should it not be approved? It's dangerous. It's dangerous. And what if I could, pro, what if I could guarantee it would only kill 20 Americans a year? That's too many. What kind of stove you have at home? kind of, st oh, I know where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of stove do you have at home? I have a gas stove. 
She has a gas stove. Natural gas, that's the fuel I was talking about. And it doesn't kill 10 or 20 Americans a year, it kills 200. But we came to accept natural gas before we got crazy about trying anything new. It's one more argument for legalizing lots of things, but you're up against a lot of fear. Another reason why I don't cook. <laughs> <laughs> And another reason why I'm single. So, <laughs> so, uh, I, I, and I'm sorry to do this to you, but everybody falls for that. But you sort of caught on like pretty quickly. I was impressed. I was like, I have no idea where he's going because I don't have a stove. I mean, maybe I do. I don't know. I don't go in my kitchen. <laughs> So um, I, I think that there were some other points that maybe you had in mind in terms of um, dialogue, or should we just open it up to uh, Q&A? Cool. Well, I guess quick round of applause for John Stossel. <laughs> that was the first thought experiment that we've had uh, from Canada Gather speakers, and I feel like we should do more of that. Um, everyone has questions. Show of hands for our Sparkos. Hi. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for being here. It's informative. So, this is a, a very abstract question. There is a spectrum upon which of of risk that libertarians sh say we should expose ourselves to. At what point is it incumbent on government to say the public cannot be informed enough? to make a rational decision as to the risk that they're taking or not taking in being exposed to something that has been legalized. Uh, he used the word libertarian. I am a libertarian like you are. Uh, I would say there is no threshold. That it's government's job to protect you from people who would physically hurt you or take your stuff and also have some pollution control rules, because there's no market incentive to behave well. And aside from that, I would say it's up to the individual, once you're an adult, to take your own risks. Dana. Isn't, isn't the main problem with marijuana prohibition that the government puts you in jail and takes your stuff? Shouldn't there be some way, if there's a political change, to make that illegal? I'm not kidding, they made Nazism illegal in Germany. Why should we put up with these narcs? They're a bunch of fascist Nazi pigs. But we do, have a, we do have a government and we want government to keep the peace. And that will allow men, there are only two ways to do things in life, right? Voluntary or force. Government is force. And we need some force, because if we're gonna punish killers and thieves, men with guns will legally come into their homes and lock them up. And that's gonna be part of civilized life. The worst places to live are the countries that don't have rule of law where everybody's afraid to build a factory because maybe your neighbor will take what you make or the dictator will take your whole factory so everybody stays poor. So we need some government. That's not here now, come on. Any more questions back there? And why don't you say who you are so your neighbors get to know you? So Jay, Jay's question was, can you comment on Alex Berenson and Malcolm Gladwell's, uh, I'll add in supposed uh, um, research and findings about correlation between cannabis and violence and mental health issues? Yeah, I, I didn't look at it carefully. I didn't do a video on it, but it seemed thin what I saw and there will always be these scare stories. And it's possible, and certainly for kids there seems to be suggestion that psychosis and schizophrenia might be a problem, but for adults, there's just very little evidence. Though one other problem I fought with the drug warrior about, he says, and the marijuana is much stronger today. And I said, 
Well, but so what? So people smoke less. You don't do a whole joint. People just take a couple tokes. But then I've noticed among some friends that, no, there are people who are sucking away at enormous <laughs> amounts, and it can't be good for you. Yeah, I mean, just to jump in, there's definitely some... Uh, there's some indication that there's um, neurodegenerative effects from um, adolescent consumption of cannabis um, before like 21. Um, folks probably shouldn't consume it except for uh, medical purposes. Um, but some of the other stuff that I've seen from Berenson is a little weak and then uh, Malcolm Gladwell is a separate conversation. Love reading his books, don't get me wrong, but separate conversation. Is there a question in there then? What did you, could you hear? Um, so I guess the first part was, which I, I think is a very good point, is that um, on this slide, um, you know, it's showing that the trend is going up, but ultimately, as we were sort of alluding to before, that the absolute number is still significantly smaller than uh, alcohol-related fatalities and other. Um, um, substance fatalities and uh, texting and things like that. Um, so it's still sort of like, yes, it's, it might be going up. And then also there's a point that uh, supposedly if you in implement in a speed limit that also there's an immediate increase in fatalities. Um, so that this number, although it might seem scary, is actually, you know, we got to legalize. Uh, and then also there's a separate point about um, the market uh, with illegal trade. All right, but let, let, let's do one thing at a time. We're getting into the weeds here. It's certainly w true about the, this statistic is thin, but we have decent tests to check if a driver is drunk and we don't yet for marijuana. Uh, people support laws against drunken driving. As a libertarian, I say there's, those laws shouldn't be there. There should be laws against reckless driving. If you're visibly endangering other people, then the cops should be allowed to arrest you. But that gives the cops a lot of leeway, too. But we are going to have these laws, and we're going to have to deal with them. I assume eventually they'll come up with something that can tell if you're stoned right then. I assume alcohol will be worse. Um, quick point to Jay. Uh, Doug said that the DPA actually has a refutation of um, Berenson's points um, and apparently has a question as well. Um, oh, okay, thank you. Um, just really quickly on the driving issue. Um, it's a, it is a problem, but uh, there, are you familiar with Mark Kleiman and his work? Okay, Mark Kleiman used to be at UCLA. He's now at NYU. His consulting company designed the system in Washington State. He's no rabid legalizer. He came out with a report last year and said the, the maximum risk for cannabis intoxication with no other drugs is about equivalent to talking on a hands-free cell phone, which is legal in every state. And, you know, there's no comparison to what you know, uh, blood alcohol content of 0.08 or above is. There's, you know, so I, I think the, the issue is wildly overblown. Um, my, my, actually, I did have a question. So we're both libertarians. Um, as yay. A, yay. Yay for libertarianism. Why aren't all of you? <laughs> um, I, think, I, think, I think some of us are. Some, some of the other people are. But um, as part of being involved with this issue, a lot of the groups we work with are very focused on the issue of racial and social justice. What responsibility do you think we as policy advocates and governments have in terms of 
rep, uh, not, I'm not going to say the word rep, reparations, but restitution to individuals and community reinvestment to the communities that have been most affected by prohibition. What, what is your take on that? Great question. Personally, I think as a rich white guy, I have a moral obligation to help people who didn't have my advantages, and I do that. But I don't, I, I, when I graduated Princeton, uh, my professors said, you know, it's an outrage that in this rich country some people are still so poor. But we know what works. We can fix this. We have programs now. We're going to start a war on poverty. And when I took my first reporting job in Portland, Oregon, it was just beginning and I was all gung-ho. And over the years, I've watched just about every program go bad and make things worse and make the victims of bad parenting or poverty worse off but now feeling more entitled to free stuff. It broke the tendrils of community where neighbors used to help neighbors. There used to be 14,000 mutual aid societies in America. Like during the depression almost nobody starved even though America was much poorer and we had 25 percent unemployment because of these mutual aid societies. And most were racist, and it was blacks helping blacks, whites helping whites, Koreans helping Koreans. But they, when they got together, when they got together, better knew who needed help and who needed a kick in the butt. When the Great Society began and the 27, I think, trillion dollars we've spent on welfare programs came, most of those mutual aid societies went away. And Private citizens do it better than the state. My opinion as a libertarian. Are there? Uh, so, in an ideal scenario for you, if cannabis was legalized without government regulation, would you be concerned about private industry, like the tobacco industry, investing in this space to add things to the product that make it addictive? Uh, you know, you have InBev who's investing, and alcohol is very addictive, destructive. So I think in that scenario, I would be most concerned about that. And my ability to know. The question was, uh, was, are you concerned about large corporations in particular adding things or altering cannabis in a way that makes it more addictive or destructive, potentially? No. In this community, in general, there are a lot of, in my opinion, conspiracy theories that are very dubious. And I've heard them for a long time and I used to believe or try to check them out and now I lo no longer bother. In the case of the example you brought up, if, if uh, the Jewel Company or why can't I think of the Altria, Philip Morris came out with some addictive thing, you would discover it and we in the media would publish, publicize it and vilify them and they would lose their business. The market protects us from that better than laws. Competition. Right there. The question was, uh, if you're free to do whatever and you cause significant self-harm, what is the potential externality and what does the government or society do in general to intervene and support? There are externalities. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it basically means areas where market competition won't solve the problem. Pollution is an externality. My smoke goes to your yard, my sewage effluent goes to your drinking water, and I don't give a shit. 
Um, no pun intended. In That's a good one. I like that. I like so that. we need government to solve those problems. But the, there are very few externalities. And I mean, this example, private insurance companies may charge you less if you uh, don't shoot heroin. And we'll have a market develop. I'm not worried about a slippery slope uh, making things, nothing can make things worse than the current banning of something a lot of people want and mostly poor people get locked up. And they probably get off the black market anyway, or illicit market, I should say. Um, we'll take one more question and then, uh, are you, are you going to come to the after party? Sure. You? Sweet. Woo. Round of applause for that. That's awesome. All right, so we'll keep the Q&A going at the after party, but we'll do one more question over there. I don't have an Can opinion. Cannabis or marijuana? No opinion. Both now. Who cares? I'll take I'll take both for one thousand, Alex. I don't know.